this morning here as we uh, get set to worship, and it's a real pleasure and honor. I don't think Tammy needs a lot of introduction, but it's, we're, it's great to have Tammy and Cameron. Cameron, I remembered, here to lead us in worship. So, uh, Tammy, why don't you... Good morning. It's so nice to be back again with you this morning to worship God through song and prayer and scripture. As we come together as the body of Christ, I invite you to stand if you're able to sing as we lift our voices in song.
Thank you, uh, uh, Tammy and Cameron, for leading us in worship and, to, uh, and putting us into a mind of worship. Uh, just a few, just actually only, first of all, I'm sure some of you saw that we have a special guest here today. It's great to have Lydia Landis with us today. Lydia came and Joyce is here. It's great to see you, Lydia. Everybody's really glad to see you here, Lydia. And Joyce, it's great to see you too. So uh, uh, make sure you say hi to Lydia today. Um, just one announcement is all, all that we have is next Sunday, as most of you know, is our day at Camp Menno Land. And uh, just an important note here of a time change, it is at 9.30. Not, not, if you show up at 9 o'clock, that would be fine, but the service doesn't start till 9.30. And just to make it sure everybody knows, no one will be here at the church. So if you need time to come and be by yourself and pray, it's a good place to come. But the whole church will be up at Camp Menoland uh, next Sunday at 9.30. Uh, Michelle, Michelle, I think, has an announcement uh, about some upcoming activity. Good morning, um, and Camp Menoland was one of my announcements here. Uh, yes, as a reminder, please remember, we will be at Camp Menoland next Sunday. Um, and if you're interested, if you need directions, they are on the fellowship hall. And then there's also just a little time frame schedule as well. It's pretty simple this year. We kind of kept the activities to a minimum, so we have more time to um, have some free time and just kind of socialize with everybody in our church family. Um, and as a reminder, we will have the swimming pool this year, not the water slide. And the pool is from 1 to 3. Um, those of you with small children, just please keep in mind, if you are at the pool, you must be there with your children. Um, and we will also have a hike afterwards, uh, led by Harry and Selma, and then we'll have lunch at 1230. And if you're staying towards 5 o'clock hour, we will have hot dogs and make your own s'mores. So that's all next Sunday at Camp Meadowland. Then our next event will be Friday, August 10th. Uh, we will be showing our outdoor movie. And this year we chose uh, the Disney Pixar movie, Up. So it is family friendly. Please plan to arrive around 7.30ish. We do like to try and start the movie as soon as it gets um, the least bit dark so we can get the movie going. So remember to bring your chairs and a blanket to sit in the lawn, and we will be providing snacks for that as well. Um, we also have in your church bulletin, you saw the thing for Iron Pigs Night, which is Friday, August 17th. If you are interested in going to that, we must have you signed up, and tickets must be prepaid in advance by next Sunday. So there is a sign-up sheet on the welcome table in the fellowship hall. If you are paying by check, just make the checks out to Align Lexington Church. And the money must be given to Darlene no later than next Sunday, July 29th. The tickets are $11 a person, and then you do get the $2 food voucher. And that night there is also fireworks, so keep that in mind as well. And right behind the welcome table on that wall I had mentioned before is our activities bulletin board. So please keep checking that throughout the year. We're going to try and keep that updated as much as possible as we plan more events and more information um, comes available for some of our events. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. A lot of exciting things coming up here at Line Lexington. All right. Um, some of you may be wondering why I have a grit shirt on. Uh, how many remember the newspaper that used to come out like on Saturday nights? It's not making a comeback. It's not going to be coming back, so uh, it's not about that. But if the others from the uh, were on the mission trip would come up, <coughs> as you know, we were on a mission trip, and uh, I guess the kids didn't get the message to wear their grit shirts. Jane, Jane and I have the message to wear the grit church, but it's great to see everybody uh, here. Uh, a few of them are not with us today, but uh, we, uh, a couple weeks ago, you guys prayed for us, and we got on the road, and we headed to Burtonsville, Maryland, which, if you know where that is, I know where that is now real well. It's about, 
halfway, it's about 30 minutes from Baltimore and 30 minutes from Washington, D.C. And I said it was the suburbs of Baltimore and Washington, four-lane highways over there all around us. It was a, uh, it was a great time. We, uh, uh, do we have some pictures here? Is the clicker here? All right, so that's us uh, loading up to uh, lead Sunday uh, from the church. And um, just other pictures. If you can see, there was a theme there, and I'll let the kids talk to about this. I'm not going to do everything here. But uh, you see, Flat Jesus. You know, we've been talking about taking Flat Jesus with us whenever you go on vacation or something. Flat Jesus was with us the whole time. Um, what is the story of this, Alicia? Just that something that you're doing with the kids all summer. It's a book. Oh, Flat Stanley. That's right. I think you just told. And he travels. Okay, I'm getting all these. I just was carrying around this little thing all week uh, down there and <laughs> just saying, "Hey, Jesus was with us." But Jesus was with us when we took off, and. Uh, we made it to our destination, which is uh, Liberty Grove United Methodist Church. And there's a week of hope. That's all the groups from Maryland, Michigan, West Virginia, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. So uh, we had a great week. Grit was the theme. And it's, if you look underneath my shirt, it says, we do tough stuff. Well, Maybe the kids do tough stuff. I maybe watched them do a lot of tough stuff, but uh, it was a great week. Uh, it, it was a, a week, uh, it's called A Week of Hope with Group Mission Trip, and um, uh, this is about our fourth trip with them, and there's our group when we got down there on Sunday night. Uh, there they all do have their grit shirts on, right? So... Uh, um, then that's, that's us serving. I'll just tell you what I did. Then I'm going to let, I'll keep clicking through the pictures, and then I'll let these kids share anything that they want. Um, my group, what they do is they split you all up. Like, I had four, was it five different ones from a, a different group? I did have Olivia in my group, and I, the other adult with me was a young lady named Jennifer from Michigan. Uh, and you worked in these work groups, and... Uh, we had three kids that, uh, this was the first time, and a lot of times when you don't know, oh, what do you mean we're going to be working with different people? The kids love it. The kids love it. Matter of fact, when they came back at night and we were at the church, they were with other people. I, I didn't really see them a lot, which was great. They, they were great kids. Uh, <laughs> um, I worked in a uh, Habitat for Humanity Restore facility. Anybody ever? I think there's one over here in Chalfont, maybe, or, or whatever. Big warehouse, and the stuff that came in there, because it's a very wealthy area where we were at, wealthy and poor, and uh, the furniture that was brought in, I, I mean, for 50 bucks, if I had a trailer, I would have brought some of it home with me because it was nicer than uh, stuff that we have at home. Uh, <laughs> I forgot I got eyes glaring at me in the back here. I could feel the burn, you know. So uh, uh, anyway, uh, that's what I did. We just took in furniture. It was great. I got to meet a couple great people. Leonard, uh, Olivia remembered Leonard, one of these guys. Just the nicest guy you're ever going to meet. Uh, had the long dreads down to his, how long was it? And uh but just uh, just the nicest nicest people in Jordan who uh, runs the uh, who ran the, sh the the shop. So uh, that's what I did all week, and uh, I'll let the others tell something about what you guys did. And I am going to keep clicking here. I I can't multitask. So I went to um, a YMCA. It's about 20 minutes away. I'm not sure what area it was in. Um, we did a lot of handiwork there. They had a camp going on during the summer, so we were fixing some stuff up for that. And then they had a preschool across the parking lot. So two days we went and 
I read stories to them and just played with the kids. And it was fun just getting, you know, I was only there for two days. And the day I came back, it was just a connection I made with the kids. It was really fun. So that's kind of what I did. Um, I was working at Habitat for Humanity, or, yeah, and I was working at the ReStore, and uh, we moved furniture and helped unload trucks, take out trash, and we'd help customers when we could, rearrange stuff. Um, yeah, like Gary said, I was able to work in his group at Habitat for Humanity, and for like the first day, they got this huge U-Haul in of stuff in the back that filled like the whole warehouse, so we had to empty that out on like the first day, but for me, the best part was I got to talk to all the customers on the rest of the week, which was interesting because I don't usually get to do that with other people, and so we had some pretty cool conversations and talked about Maryland and all the great stuff that the ReStore had to offer, so, yeah. And I went to a retirement community, which was a very nice community. I said I was right up there with Peter Becker and Doc. It was bells and whistles, so that was really nice. Um, they did have grace on us. It was about 100 degrees all week, so we did not have to work outside. <sighs> So um, we were inside um, just mingling with the residents, did a lot of games, did a lot of crafts. Um, since it was July 4th, they had our group do a patriotic presentation. So we actually, because I did not have a vehicle, I was paired with another group. Um, I should start, my group had five junior high kids. Um, junior high kids are a little bit of a um, stretch for me. Um, <laughs> Their focus and my focus is about the same, zero. But um, it was a little tough to keeping them on task, but we were paired with another group, and that was helpful because there was a lot of older kids, and um, we were able to pull together a um, patriotic tour that we did for the folks. Um, you will not see it in Broadway, but it was done. So anyway, so we had a good time. I do want to say about these kids, um, Within 12 hours, 24 hours, I'll say the first night, our group of um, kids quickly made friends. Like the first night, I was like, what are you guys doing? Realizing they already were all playing mafia with a bunch of kids um, in, a, in a group. So um, I think um, our boys probably were the oldest boys there, and I've heard girls say probably the cutest boys that were there. So we did have a lot of attention quickly, um, which was fun. For them, um, I kept all my eyes, mother eyes, going. But um, I was pleased how quickly the, the kids, our group, did intermingle and get to know the other kids. There was about 60 kids between the five churches there. Um, that's our main meeting hall. So that was a very good um, experience for them. We've had years where we've had much smaller groups, and this year it was fun to have that many, that many kids um, along with us. You saw a couple pictures of us doing random things. Our night off, we, um, they give us a night off. We're supposed to go out and with our church group only and get to know the community. So we went out for dinner, and we went bowling. And um, what they had at this bowling alley was called duck bowling. They're little pins. I thought it was for children's parties, but it was little pins with a little ball. So we had a lot of fun. Jesus came with us. He had a lot of fun. And um, another event that we did since it was July 4th, we went to see fireworks down closer to Washington. Columbia. 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 And apparently what you do, you stop on the highway when they start, and that's what you had seen on a couple of the pictures. Vehicles just pulled over to the side. It was a three-lane highway lane. The third lane out was still running, but lanes two and one and side were all stopped with cars watching the fireworks, which was a different event. So the kids were out. Kids were on top of the van. Kids were all over the place watching fireworks. But it was um, it was a fun week. It was a it was a good week. Um, I will say we had the best facilities that we've ever had. There was air conditioning. 
um, in the church, so that was a nice blessing also. And the church, this was their first year to do that, so they opened our arms with, or opened their church very nicely with welcoming hands. They gave um, a lot of perks. I think the showers that we were supposed to have, just like tent bag showers, they actually framed up, put blue tarps around, and tried to get hot water to us. If you ran two showers, there was hot water. And um, <laughs> and they also, different Sunday school classes in the church often had ice cream for us when we got back from the afternoon as a treat. Um, you could just tell they were glad to have the kids in their facility and um, have us in there using their church. I think that's it. Um, just one thing, uh, the grit theme here was, it, the theme was for the week. And if you're familiar with group, it's a... Group missions is part of group publishing. It's all under the same umbrella, separate. Uh, the, the teaching that we had was great, was top-notch. Uh, uh, we talked a lot about Peter and his relationship with Jesus, and uh, everybody knows that was kind of a touch-and-go sometimes. But it was a, a great week of uh, learning, and it was just fun. I'll tell you what, if, you know, you almost feel like a proud parent because you saw how your kids were intermingling and they were they were respectful to the red shirts. The red shirts are the leaders from group. And it was just really me. And I just got to say, you know, when you're with these kids for a week, you learn to know them so much better. And I, I, I got, it was fun to watch Dylan get involved. He's kind of a quiet kid. Uh, everybody, all, I don't want to pick out, but I, I had Olivia in our group the whole week. I never saw Olivia in the light that she was down there, outgoing. She was amazing. She led devotions every day at our lunchtime. And uh, I, I, I said, wow, Olivia. I was really impressed. Uh, the way she made friends, uh, she made the comment on the last day coming back from her job. Is, did, I don't know if you cried, but you might have been close, that I'll never see you guys again, you know, because you're from all over. And uh, when I hear things like that, that means the kids had a really great, I believe, life-changing time down there. So I just want to say thank you again to the church for the support that you, you've given us uh, and, and know that you can be proud of these kids and what they did for, uh, for uh, Jesus as the hands and feet that week. So uh, thank you again. So, all right, guys. <laughs> Flat Jesus is with me here too. So, uh, all right, I'm gonna. We're gonna move into the uh, prayer time uh, again. We're thankful uh, that the only. Immediate need as still as Laurie, Laurie Martin, who uh, is home, and that's a good news. And I was talking with her, and I believe that she's healing well. So the, there's a lot to be thankful for there for uh, Laurie, as she is at home uh, recovering. Um, I know um, she says this every time I talk to her. She would love to have visitors, and I said this the last week or two. Uh, it was great getting to know her. Uh, her story over the last couple weeks, and uh, I'm sure you would be blessed if you had a chance to stop down and just visit her for a little bit. If you know where Ambler Church is, Ambler Mennonite, I believe she lives like right next to the church or right near the church, so it shouldn't be hard to find. Uh, that is it for the immediate prayer needs. There are prayer needs listed in the bulletin. Don't for, uh, forget to continue to pray uh, every day for those needs. Okay, will you join me in prayer? God, we thank you for hearing our prayers. And as we come here this morning uh, to learn, to worship, I just pray that, that we just leave all the noise and all the things that are going on in our lives to be put aside and to concentrate and focus solely on you. I pray that you be with uh, Pastor Jim as he uh, brings us the message this morning. I pray that you give him the words that we need to hear, Father. 
Father, we are commanded to be your hands and feet and to go and uh, spread the good news of your love to everyone, no matter who they are. And I am just so thankful that uh, that the mission trip that we were on, that all the young people that were there, our young people, that their lives were changed just a bit from that week of doing your work. And I know that sometimes uh, the jobs that we're asked to do for you are hard and they're, and they're tough, but that's when we need to get some grit and go and do the tough stuff, Lord. I just, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity that uh, we had, that the church here gives us, that we can take these young people uh, to these life-changing uh, events, Lord. So we just thank you and praise you for that. And Lord, again, uh, we pray for each one here today. We pray for them, and I just pray that you be with them right where they're at in their lives right now, Father. And I just pray that uh, we all just leave here a little bit better because we know more about you. And Lord, we do continue to pray for all the needs that are listed in the bulletin. And again, we pray for Laurie as she is now recovering at home, Lord. We just are thankful for the healing that has taken place, and we're thankful for the healing that will take place in Laurie's life so that she can be better and go back to teaching art, which is what she loves to do, Father. So we lift up Laurie to you right now. Father, for all the unspoken needs, we lift them up to you. We pray that you work your will in each one of those situations. And now as we... Um, uh, uh, receive the offering, Father. I just pray that um, you bless each one who gives. We are to give. Nothing we have is ours, Lord. It all belongs to you. And I just pray that, again, that you bless each one who gives. We pray this in your name. Amen. I'm no longer. 
we sing this next song, I just invite you to use it as a prayer as we prepare our hearts to dig deeper into God's word. May our hearts cry out, Lord, speak to each and every one of us. I invite you to join me as we sing. Speak, oh Lord. Whoops, sorry. Oh Lord. Now I got it, sorry. Speak, oh Lord, as we come to you, to I'll be reading Romans 8, verses 14 to 32. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, 
but you receive the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ. Indeed, we may share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation will itself will be liberated from bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the chains as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown in, inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to, to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes, intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things God works for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to, conf to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he may be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Well, it's good to be back with you. Good to see you all. Trust and pray you're having a good summer. And uh, my wife and I have been uh, busy uh, going here and there. And um, I've had the opportunity to preach a number of places. Haven't been back with you for a while, but it's good to be back here. I want to thank you very much as a congregation that you made Robin and me uh, at home here uh, after our time at St. Peter's. And being able to come and worship with you and be part of your congregation over this last year. I would just also let you know that um, as of yesterday, one week ago, uh, Robin and I welcomed our fifth grandchild and our first grandson. And uh, Ezra James Fox, uh, son of uh, Peter and Daphne Fox, was uh, welcomed into the world. So we are indeed thankful. You notice there is a, um, an outline in your bulletin. And uh, I want us to look together uh, at Romans 8. There are always stories that uh, catch our attention that we hear in the news. Um, a couple weeks ago, there were two stories the very different. The one story, it seemed like it caught the imagination of the whole world. It was a story of the boys trapped in the cave in Thailand who were then incredibly and miraculously rescued by folks who came with various skills from around the world. And all of those boys and their coach were able to make it out of that cave safely after 18 days underground. But at the same time that was taking place, 
You know, just a couple days ago, we had this case of uh, Branson, Missouri, where folks are on vacation. They go out on the duck boat, and uh, the duck boat is inundated by high waves on the lake. And uh, what was it, 17 or 18 people died, but nine people from one family. A couple weeks ago, there was a case of a family from Teaneck, New Jersey. Um, they were coming back from Ocean City, Maryland, and driving through the state of Delaware for some unexplicable reason. A uh, pickup truck crossed the median strip and hit them head on. Beautiful family, mother, father, and four daughters. And you remember what happened? Uh, only the mother survived. But here's the thing that hit me. I heard, as I was walking by the radio, I heard a newscaster tell that story, and it said about the mother and widow, she's in the hospital, She's expected to make a full recovery. And what hit me was that is a very strange and curious choice of phrases to talk about someone who does not have life-threatening injuries after her husband and her four daughters were suddenly killed while they're on vacation. But here's a question I have. So we have in one case this situation where in the Thai cave rescue you have this incredible heartwarming sort of thing that captures the imagination of the whole world. And the other case, whether you're talking about the Branson duck boat or the family from Teaneck, you say, how is it that we have these sudden inexplicable tragedies. And here's the question. Do we live in an either-or world or both-and world? We wish we lived in an either-or world where only things were good and sweetness and light and all stories had easy to understand happy endings. But that's not the world in which we live. And it seems to me as we look at those two different stories, those two different things that were on the news and the kind of world in which we live, it causes us to understand theologically a couple of basic things that the scripture teaches, up, uh, teaches us about the world in which we live and about creation. Number one, we are made in the image of God. We have the ability to do wonderful, kind, gracious things that reflect the very nature of God within us. And number two, we live in a fallen world. And because of the fall, there is suffering there is pain, there is evil, and there are things that are very hard to explain. And so in that context, there is a scripture that I believe many of us have memorized, and the scripture is Romans 8.28. Now the thing is, I've used the New International Version. I did not memorize it from the New International Version when I was being discipled, and it depends on what uh, version you have used. But you know that God causes all things to work together for good, for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. Immediately when we think of that scripture, a number of questions should come to mind. The questions that we would want to ask would include these. What does Paul mean by all things? I think what Paul means by all things is all things. God causes all things to work together for good. 
As a matter of fact, if you'd go down and look at Romans 8.35, the Apostle Paul actually gives a list which seems to be a list of things that are specifically being meted out toward Christians, the new Christian community, and he says this, who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall, and he lists, listen to these things he lists, seven specific things, shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. And he goes on, as is written, we are being put to death all the day long. Those are things specifically that seems to be meted out for Christians. And so the next question is, therefore, if it's all things, are all things good? We need to understand that in the world, though God is good, though God is in control, are all things good? No, not all things are good. God causes all things to work together for good, but are all things good? No. I want to tell you a story, but before I do, another theological term is the term when we ask the question, how is it that God can cause all things to work together for good? The theological term is providence. But instead of giving you a theological definition, I'd rather use a working definition. And the working definition is from a familiar story from the book of Genesis. And hopefully this is a passage of scripture you've memorized also. Genesis 50, 20. You remember the story of Joseph? Joseph, the favorite son. Joseph, the spoiled son. Joseph, the most beloved son. Joseph, the annoying brother to the other brothers and the brothers come up with a terrible, terrible scheme. And in that scheme, they fake the death of their brother, sell him into slavery, and keep a terrible family secret for who knows how many years. Years and years later, as an adult, the brothers go back to Egypt to try to find help for the famine that has spread across the land. And Joseph has been guided by God, risen in authority in the land of Egypt, and has put, a plate, put in place a plan to be able to keep the Egyptian people fed and cared for during the seven years of famine. Joseph's father, Jacob, dies. And do you remember the brother's concern? At the death of Jacob, oh no, now that our father is dead, Joseph is going to get back at us. What does Genesis 50, 20 say? Joseph answers him and says this, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to bring about the current situation and the delivery of many people. Friends, that is the working definition of providence. The hand of God is able to work. Was it good what happened to, to Joseph? Was it good what Joseph's brothers did to him? Anybody want to say it was good? No, of course it wasn't good. But Joseph was able to say, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to bring about this current situation and the delivery or the saving of many people. So the story I wanted to tell you, it's, it's one of those stories, and, and Gary, you know about these kind of stories. There's the sort of stories you don't know if they're true or if they were made up by some pastor because it made an incredibly good uh, sermon illustration, but I'll tell you that story anyway. So the story is of a terrible shipwreck in an earlier time. And the ship went down, but only one sailor from the whole ship survived. 
and he survived somehow by clinging to pieces of that shipwreck and drifting to a deserted island. There he began to make a life for himself. He began to forage and find food. He even built a little hut where he would be able to get out of the elements. He's been there who knows how long. And lo and behold, he goes off on his daily trip to forage for food, and as he comes back toward the beach, he sees flames. He sees smoke. And what has happened is, for some unknown reason, his hut has gone up in flames. His first cry was, God, how could you allow this to happen? Then he said, God, how could you do this? And finally, in absolute anguish, he just said, how could you? Still despondent the next day, sleeping on the beach, he's awakened by a sound. And there's a shadow that moves in front of his face. And unsure what he's seeing there, someone says, we're here for you. You're here for me. What do you mean? We're here to rescue you. Well, how did you know I was here? Well, we saw your, your warning fire and your smoke signals. But here's what I want to say. If life was so easy that what happened was for every terrible event that came in life, there was an immediate good and discernible event that we saw related to that, and we saw the hand of God immediately, life would be incredibly easy. And when we go through difficult times, we'd say, oh boy, I can't wait to see what good God's going to bring. I don't know about you. But that has not been my experience. My experience is not that typically there is some immediate discernible good that happens after tragedy. But rather, what we have is the need to see that there is a wonderful promise and what is that wonderful promise? The wonderful promise is from Romans 8, 28. But we want to look at it in its larger context. We want to look at the key insights in the context and the keys that we see here. The first thing I want you to see is this. To understand Romans 8, 28, you need to understand where it falls in the greater scope of the whole book of Romans. You could do a, an outline of the book of Romans that was very extensive, but if I was to say the book of Romans has three main parts, it's very easy. It's this, how great is our sin, how great is God's grace, how great, therefore, should be our gratitude. And if we look at Romans 8.28, this scripture falls in the second portion of that outline. In the reality that Paul tells us first how pervasive and extensive that sin and the fall and how it has impacted the entire world, he then goes on to tell us how amazing and extensive is the grace of God and the redemption in Jesus Christ, which is going to make all things new. It is in that second part of Romans that Paul speaks to us, that God is at work in a fallen world, and in the work of Jesus Christ, he's redeeming the entire world and working to bring us and buy us back from the power of sin. So often we think of sin as just being that thing that we do wrong and we need forgiveness. Yes, it is that. But sin is also the aspect that the world has fallen and we live in a broken world. But there's good news in that broken world. The second thing we see is this. When we read Romans 8, 14 
through 17, it says this. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. This, as the Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, that you should live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption of sunset, sonship. And by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share with His sufferings in order that also we might share with His glory or share in His glory. The thing I want you to see here, the word Abba is Aramaic for Father, but it's really Father in the um, kind of... Uh, familiar, even baby talk. And, and so instead of saying father, which is so formal, we might say papa or daddy. The first thing that we need to understand and the first thing that we have to have, if there is to be good news for us, is that God is good. He loves us as a father. He cares for us with an everlasting love. The book of James says that all good and perfect gifts come down from where? From the Father of lights. If you know how to good, give good gifts to your children, what does Scripture say? How much more so shall your heavenly Father in heaven? So the first thing we need to believe is even when it seems tough, and even when it's not explainable, and even when we don't understand, we need to have the trust that God is good and God is our Father. The second thing we see is this. We want to have a proper perspective. The Apostle Paul says in verse 18, For I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared or worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. Paul elsewhere in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18 says this, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Now listen to what he says. This is a guy who suffered shipwreck, who's been run out of town, the people have tried to kill him, he's, he's been in jail, and he says this. this. This cracks me up. For our momentary light troubles... Momentary light troubles? <laughs> Wait, Paul. <laughs> you've been shipwrecked. You've been attacked by dogs. Um, people have run you out of town. People are trying to kill you. They're on your tail. You've been thrown into jail. And our moment, and you've also been beaten. And our momentary light afflictions. Moment? Oh, wow. That's not how I would, that's not what I would call it. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. But here's the point. What is a proper perspective? It's a long-range view. We live in the present, we experience the present, and the present is always our point of reference. But as Christians, we look with hope and realize <laughs> that those troubles we go through are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in or to us. The next thing we ask is this. How do we pray? I want you to say it is all right to not know how to pray. Because when we go through difficult times, we don't know how to pray. And that's what the scripture says. Listen to what the word of God says. In the same way the spirit helps us in our weaknesses, we do not know how we ought to pray. But the spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Hmm. What's fascinating about that word groan? Here it's a, a noun, but earlier on there's the verb. Remember what it said about creation? 
the whole creation is what? Groaning for release. When we go through difficult times, there will be times, and, and church, realize you can be a faithful person, you can be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, but you don't have to understand everything. And there are times we go through life and things get tough, and I don't know your stories, but you have been places and are maybe going through places, and whatever it is, you don't even know how to pray, and that's all right. Go to God with the person or the situation and just say, I don't know how to pray. And let the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, within you, just groan. Just groan. Lord, I don't even know how to bring this to you, but here it is. And it's all right. We think about what is good news. And what I want you to think about is God's purpose. I always memorize Romans 8.28. How many of you memorize Romans 8.28? How many of you memorize Romans 8.28 and 29? Me neither. But the verses are connected. The verses are a continuation. Listen as I read to you these two verses together. And we know that in all things God works for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. Stop. That's where we stop, right? Listen to what it says. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. Now listen to this. What was God's set plan? What was his predestined plan for us? He's about to tell us. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to what? To be conformed to the image of his Son. That he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. What's God's will for you? What's God's purpose for you? According to this verse. To become more and more conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. We don't get that part often, do we? We stop at God causes all things to work to their for good. But how is it going to work for good? And what's the good? The good purpose often is in molding us more and more into the image of Christ Jesus. Do you know a verse of Scripture that blows me out of the water and I still can never get my head to wrap around it? Book of Hebrews I think it's 5-2, but I'm not sure. Of Jesus Christ, it says this. God caused him, Jesus, to learn obedience. What's the rest of the verse say? Through the things that he suffered. Now, wait a second. The sinless son of God was caused to learn obedience through the things that he suffered? I think how much more so for those of us who are fallen, those of us who are sinful, might God work in our sufferings to help us to become more and more in the image of his son. God's predestined set purpose for our good is to become molded into the image of Jesus, accomplished often by suffering or difficulty, and also that we might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, that God might use us as we have dealt with difficulties to show forth the work of God in our lives that others might come to Christ. So how do we react? I want to consider with you two men, their specific tragedies, and the two songs that they wrote. And I bet you dollars to... Can I bet dollars to donuts in a church? <laughs> Don't eat donuts anyway. They're not good for you. I'll bet you dollars to donuts. You know the second song better than you know the first song.
Horatio Spafford. Let me tell you about Horatio Spafford. He was a Presbyterian layman living in Chicago. And this would have been, uh, he was born uh, in 1828, died in 1888 at the age of 60. He was a very, very successful lawyer. He had built up a considerable fortune by investing in real estate, but the great Chicago fire wiped out all of his real estate. He had four daughters and one son. The year before the great fire, their only son died. After all of things had been wiped out as a faithful person in his Presbyterian church and a strong supporter of the work of D.L. Moody, he said to his wife, we need some time away. Let's go over to Europe where D.L. Moody is going to be ministering. We'll help in that, uh, in that outreach and we'll have some time to relax and be together. The last minute, some things took place. He had to attend the business. He sent his wife and four daughters ahead, and he was going to join them later. You know the story, right? While they're on the way, another boat hit the ship. Within 12 minutes, the ship sank. And the telegram that he got from his wife when she arrived in Europe was saved alone. All four of their daughters died in that shipwreck. Do you know his song? How many know his song? Spafford's song, if you can see that, it is well with my soul. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, what? It is well, it is well with my soul. Do you know this guy? Anybody know this guy? He was a contemporary of Spafford's. Didn't know each other. He actually um, was a physician. Um, but to say that Brewster Higley was unlucky in love would be an understatement. He was married five times. <sighs> His first wife died from disease in 1852. His second wife left Higley, and it's believed that she took up with her former wife. She took his, ch his children away as well and left him. His third wife uh, was injured, and she died. And he married a fourth woman. And that relationship was so terrible that what he did is he left he took his children and dropped them at a relative in Chicago and continued heading west. When he got to Kansas, he stopped. He claimed some land through the Homestead Act and lived in a dugout for a time. You know those dugouts, those underground kind of houses they had? Then he finally built a cabin and he started writing some poetry. And he wrote a poem called My Western Home. And then he had a friend who was a musician and helped him put it to music. Anybody know the song? Oh, give me a home where the buffalo roam, where the deer and the antelope play. What else? Where seldom is heard a discouraging word, and the skies are not cloudy all day. Here's a question I have for you. Which operative theology do we really work under? Which one of these songs? When sorrows like sea billows roll, you have taught me to say, it is well with my soul. Or do we say, Give me a life 
where things are idyllic and peaceful and no one speaks ill of me. And you know what? We don't even have days like this. It's just always sunny. I dare say that for many of us as Christians in the United States, we kind of are more home on the range folks than it is well with my soul folks, aren't we? I mean, honestly? Well, there is good news, though. And just as a reminder, we do have the sense that God is good. God is our Papa. We have the sense that we can have a proper perspective and, and look at things from the long term and have a hope that is sure and certain. We also realize that there are going to be times that we go to pray, we don't know how to pray, and that's all right. Let the Holy Spirit pray through you, even with groanings when you don't have words to say. And realize this that when things are very, very difficult and you can't explain it and it just seems dark and it just seems hard and you don't have answers, there might be a way that God is working through that very difficult time to mold you more and more into the image of Christ. But it's not easy. And it doesn't make it easy. But it's the way God might work. But finally... What I would say is this. I want to give you also a word of warning. This is a word of warning as someone who's served as a, served as a pastor for a whole lot of years. What I would say is this. When you see a dear brother or sister going through a real difficult time, in most cases, if not all cases, it's not your job to try to tell them how God is going to work for good in their situation. Let them discover that. You might ask them questions like, how is God present to you? This is a very difficult time you're going through. How can I pray for you? I'm so sorry for the difficulty and the hardship that you're going through. But don't be the one to glibly come in there and that's how it will often be received and say, oh my, I understand. You know what? The good news is God's going to work together for good. That is true. Just because it's true doesn't mean that we have to be the one to say it. God can do the work. But finally, what the Apostle Paul concludes this chapter with is this. In verses 36 and following, As it is written, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now listen to this. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons Neither things present, nor things future, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will what? Will what? Will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Friends, no matter what you go through, believe this and hold on to it. Nothing will ever happen in your life that will separate you from the everlasting love of God. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we conclude our time together, I invite you to take out um, your blue hymnal and turn to number 226, or the words will also, oh, I'm sorry, green, green hymnal. I apologize. Um, if you'd like to, if you'd like to, you can turn in your hymnal, or um, I believe the words will be on the screen. Let's stand together as we finish with this song. You are
Thank you, uh, Pastor, for the uh, great words that we heard today. Uh, why don't you join me in a closing prayer? God, uh, thank you for what we heard today. Father, we uh, know that you are our Heavenly Father, that no matter what we're going through, you are there to love us, to hold us, to carry us. And it's like we heard this morning, life really wasn't promised to be easy, but we are promised that you are there to be with us through everything that we face on this earth, and nothing can compare to the glory that we're going to have in the future, and we thank you for this promise through your word. Now, be with us as we go today, Lord. I just pray that you bless each one this week, and I just pray that we leave here today better equipped to go and face the things ahead of this week and in the future. We pray this in your name. Amen. Go in peace.